Hi, this is Ronald Johnson, your life coach, mentor coach. And what I do is I help people that are tired of who they are and where they are in life. And this is Gloria, your life coach. I help those who are feeling stuck, struggling with difficulties such as self-doubt, inner judgment, lack of confidence, life transitions, and taking steps forward. And welcome to Life's A Shuffle podcast. Now, you may wonder why it's called Life's A Shuffle. And the reason why we came up with this title was that life is really shuffling. And it doesn't matter where you come from, your background, what age you are, you're shuffling multiple things in life. And the best thing to know in life is everybody faces your struggles and everybody faces what you're going through. But there's hope in learning something about that. So when our guests share their journey, the hope is you learn something in that journey so yourself can navigate the struggles you face, the low self-esteem, the self-confidence. And that's why we call podcast Life's a Shuffle. And throughout this podcast, we share our personal overcoming stories, as well as our guests who shares their personal journey in overcoming their personal struggles. Life's a Shuffle podcast is here to connect like-minded individuals. And thank you for listening to Life's a Shuffle podcast. Hi, this is Gloria, Life Coach, and welcome to another episode of Life's a Shuffle. It's the last day of the year. And it doesn't mean the last episode either. So this is right. Ronald Johnson, your Life Coach, Mindful Coach, and welcome to Life's a Shuffle with many more episodes to come. This is our last episode of the year. Man, I'm glad I started. We're glad we started, and I'm so excited uh, to have another coach from IPEC. We went to the same school together, um, not the same time, but you know we got the same information. And he's going to talk about his story for last year and how he can help and motivate those out there and maybe experience the same difficulties in their lives. So our special guest, Jordan Ross, the amazing coach, the leader. Buddy, take it away. Your turn. Yeah. So first off, guys, I want to thank you for having me on here. Both of you have amazing podcast voices. I think it's just so soothing to hear your voice. So hopefully I could syndicate that same sentiment. So yeah, so for everyone listening, yes, I'm, my name is Jordan Ross. As of today, I am a business coach and I'm a high performance coach. And, you know, Ron, before we got on the call, one of the things you're saying is share, share about who you are today. And I think that's a really interesting question. Because especially on podcasts, or even if someone says, tell me about yourself, we tell people what we do. But I think the more important thing is telling people who we actually are, especially in 2021. And without labels, right? I'm, I'm a passionate human being here to really spread as much love and transformation in the world at its highest level. I think that breaks me down to the core. Um, what I do, so that that's more my why. What I do is first and foremost, I'm a husband to an amazing wife, Taylor. She is everything to me, more important than any other area of my life. And then from the career side, I'm a I'm a high performance business coach. So I work with entrepreneurs and coaches, helping them scale their companies to six and seven figures um, using a systematic approach um, where everything is measured in inputs, data, and, you know, creating a process to make it happen. Awesome, dude. Look at that. So when you think about Jordan, obviously you've changed over the years. What has made you where you are today? I mean, did, before became a, a, a coach for entrepreneurs, high performance business people, how did you, did you start that way? Did you have a full-time job? What, what, what was the transition there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, so I think let, if let's take a step back and how I got here really starts from my core. And, you know, before the show, we were talking about life in high school and what that looked like, but I think the big differentiator going back even to high school and in sports and even in grades, I, I've always been one of the hungriest people on the field and in the classroom. Like I've, I've just had this insatiable drive to, to be great and do great things. Um, and flashing back to 2015, I was at an undergrad at Ohio state where at that point in my life, I was a, a junior in college. I had 
plenty of internships lined up. So I knew I was going to have a job after college. I think it was by after the first full month of my junior year, I was, I was chilling, Ron. I had an internship with Pepsi that summer. So I had pretty much the whole school year to do whatever I wanted because I knew my grades didn't matter. I started partying a lot, drinking a lot. And then flash forward six months later, I started, I, I didn't go into a depression, but I felt like shit. I looked around and I'm like, I am literally just drinking and partying. I'm barely doing school. I'm not adding any value to anyone. And I had a friend at that time introduce me to this concept of podcasting 2015, right? Still very new. And I started podcasting and it started to allow me to have an outlet to feel like I was growing. That's what I was missing in my life. I wasn't growing. And I turned all that, you know, that hunger and that passion to do great things into my self-development. And from 2015 on is when I found entrepreneurship, coaching, right? Business, self-development, mindset, EQ, all, all those things, um, which really put me down this path. For when I graduated, I had known for a long time I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I didn't know how. Uh, I heard a presentation from Amazon. They're like, hey, you can graduate and start to manage a team of 30 to 100 people. I was a junior at the time. And I remember thinking that I'm like, holy crap. I can immediately get leadership training because in the back of my mind, I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I knew that I had to have a a certain skill set to be an entrepreneur. And one of them is definitely leadership and operations. So I heard that presentation with Amazon. I'm like, there we go. This is the outlet that I've been waiting for. And I signed up. I got a job. I interviewed. I got a job with Amazon. Started working in Columbus, Ohio, and we launched the largest volume fulfillment center in the world at the time. So this is in 2016. I graduated Ohio State at the age of 21, and I started managing a team of 100 to 120 people at the age of 21. The average employee was probably around 30, like 35 to 40. And there I am, a 21 year old leading a team of 100 plus people doing volumes that the world has never seen in supply chain and operations. And 24 hours, there were a few days where we did over a million units coming in. I was running inbound. I was failing so, so miserably. I almost lost my job in March of 2017. And I remember at that point, I had still been learning, still been podcasting. I was so upset. How come I got so far in my career, like so far in my life, I got the job I wanted and I'm about to fail, I'm about to be fired. And that's when I realized I really had to tune in. Um, And I started purchasing courses, programs, trainings, coachings. And one of those programs, it introduced two amazing concepts to me that absolutely shattered the way I looked at the world and changed my life. One was how do you prioritize and reverse engineer goals? And the second was asking questions. And you guys love totally resonate with this. When I started asking questions to my employees, I started prioritizing the things that really mattered and everything in a 30 day period changed. I went from one of the worst in my, in my building to one of the best in the country within Amazon. I learned I had this innate capacity to ask great questions and people just started to change around me. I saw this one woman, Catrice, she was second guessing herself, such low confidence. I just told her, I looked at her, I'm like, you're so amazing. Like you can do such great things. And I started asking her questions to make her think and she completely changed her life around. And that's when I got hooked. I found IPEC. Um, I was speaking to a friend who was also an IPEC grad and she pointed me in that direction and then in March of 2018, I started my coaching journey. And that, you know, that's what absolutely captivated my imagination. I found that that was my calling. And I only felt that one other time in my life. I remember when I met my wife, I was like, wow, this is the woman I'm meant to be with her. This is it. And when I went into my, it's called Mod One. I'm sure you guys have talked about it in New York. I sat, I stood in the back of that room and I was like, holy, holy cow. This is where I'm meant to be. And that, that's the inception journey of how I got into coaching. I'll, I'll pause here. <laughs> wow. Congratulations. That yes, is dude. such a turn around, like a great one. I, I want to kind of go back a little bit um, to your college years. Uh, it didn't, it seemed like it didn't really take you long enough to get out of the situation that you were in and to kind of wake up from you know, the, um, the partying, the drinking, I think that's what we call quote unquote college life. Yep. <laughs> and I just kind of, we, we have a lot of 
listeners who are in school and, you know, looking forward into going into college, I just wanted to um, kind of give us some something on what was that like for you? What did it feel like for you going through a whole situation and just kind of snapping out of it? <sighs> it was like a coming to moment, right? Like, I remember... I think I lacked so I lacked authenticity. Partying and drinking in college was a blast. It was a great time, but when it came down to it, in between the parties where I just kind of drank myself drank myself into a, a drunk haze because well, there's nothing else to do. This is a great time. In between those weekend nights, lacking enough like lacking authenticity. And to your question, right when I realized that. I love to learn. I'm really hungry and I want to put that put that energy in a specific direction. It was one of the first times in my life where I really started to believe in something bigger than myself, right? When you podcast, your your eyes are opened up to so many different routes and opportunities. So I learned about so many different things, just captivated my imagination and right and, and allowed me to really see a future for myself bigger than just a job. Mm -hmm. Just like connecting with your authentic self, you have to check in or check within yourself. Mm. Yeah, it was it was awareness. One of the first moments of like real awareness in my life. You know, I have something that I want to dive into because I, maybe I missed it, maybe it was skipped. So when you work with Amazon, so I've heard your story, and obviously, you know, you're partying, you're drinking, you're having this um, sense of man, I'm going to be part of something. This is cool for right now, right? But obviously, a period of time is wore you out. And that resonated with me. In 2009, I had a buddy of mine, and I was hungry for women. So I'm partying Thursday. I'm partying Friday. Shit, on Sunday, I'm exhausted, okay? After a while, I said, this is bullshit. I cut this. And I went back to the basics, like working out, my health, and all that stuff. But when you almost got fired from Amazon, what what happened was you got a bad review or what something size says jordan cut the bullshit what's going on yeah so what what i gave you guys a high level that was a course of my first six months at amazon really six first six to nine months and when i got into amazon i went into a strategy that had just worked for every other area of my life study and work my ass off work longer work hard, move as fast as possible. And it didn't work. Like I said, so when you're working, especially in a fulfillment center, it, I want you guys to just imagine and just picture this standing in front of a semicircle of a hundred people. And now I want you to imagine those hundred people go get dispersed and pretend you're around a track, disperse around half of that track. And it's your job to manage those people, make sure they're performing, make sure they have everything they need and make sure they feel good. Well, I could work my ass off for 10 and 20 people, but the, the scale of leadership doesn't work when you just work hard, right? And what happened was I just continued, my results were poor. My team wasn't performing. We had bi-weekly meetings, one-on-ones with our managers, and I heard it. And there was just one time in March of 2017, my manager looked at me. He's like, Jordan, you're going to have to turn something around or we're going to have to have, have to start to have really serious conversations. And I knew what that meant because I had seen people get transitioned out already at Amazon. Um, and that that's what it looked like. It just looked like absolute exhaustion. I was working so hard and getting no results because you can't scale hard work. It, you have to scale smart work is what I learned. And that's where the, the courses came in about prioritization, leverage, asking questions. You know what? You hit some a core with me. Have you read the book called A Conscious Business? I haven't. No. Okay. So I can't remember the name right now, but it's a really popular book. And he talked about two different kinds of leaders. One's that lead for performance and one that lead for development. So when I heard you talk about that, you have a bunch of people and you're just like, okay, I'm going to work my ass off. I'm going to develop Joe, Bob, Susie, Tam. Okay, I'm working. You're just trying to lead by performance. Okay, you're not doing this fast enough. Then you get on their case, right? Then you get on the next person's case. Instead, you, when you start leading from you know, development, 
things started working out, not only for yourself, because first you have to develop Jordan, but then it worked out for the rest of the people. So the energy of vibration from development versus performance actually started becoming better because most leaders, you know, I had a full-time job and my director strictly laid for performance. So his idea was, I'm going to tell you how shitty you are because it's going to make you work harder. I'm going to threaten to fire you because it make you work harder. And I, I would call him, the, um, have you ever seen the movie called Lord of the Rings? Of course. I love Lord of the Rings. Yes. Okay. I love it too. So, you know, in the movie, it wasn't Gandalf, it was the other dude. They talked about the iron, iron fist of the orc. So my boss reminded me of Lord of the Rings with the iron fist of the orc. So the only way from the movie is with the iron fist. And, and the, the company reminded me of the Black Gates of Mordor. Oh, God. There's only one way in and one way out. That's what Mike, because all they knew and understand is divide and conquer, leave for performance. So when I left those Black Gates of Mordor, oh, my God, life changed for me. That's the best thing <laughs> I could get. <laughs> that that brings a, that brings a visual to mind right there. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> well, I'm glad you love Lord of the Rings and you can understand. Because I tell people that it's like goes over their head and like, what is he talking about? But if you've seen the movie, you've seen more than one. You know about the Black Gates of Mordor. You know about the Iron Fist of the Orc. So that's remind me of. But yeah, I mean, it, it it really it honed on the fact that you realized for yourself there has to be something. I commend this dude because most people don't understand that. They think, well, I'm going to get fired from Amazon. Shit, I'm going to find another job. Mm-hmm. They just, I quit. I'm going to get fired. You took the, the bull by the horn and said, you know what? Okay, there has to be a solution to this problem. It's like when I was growing up, my dad would say, son, you're overweight. And I said, yes, I know that. I need some help. You know what? Use big bone. Okay, that doesn't, that doesn't exist. It was my eating habits, my lack of commitment to getting better would transfer me to being overweight, right? So by committing yourself, man, that you fact, you say, I have to do something different. I'm not going to quit on this. Just go to another opportunity. I'm going to do what it takes, put it into work and change. And you did it, man. So congratulations, dude. Awesome well, job. Thank you. And I, I, I want to pull out a, a piece of insight as to why I was able to do that. And, you know, and what they teach in NLP, so NLP is Neuro Linguistic Programming. That's about 80% of everything Tony Robbins does is from the field of NLP. And you, if you want to accomplish anything in your life over a sustained period of time, you need to have a move towards goal. And kind of what I, and what I alluded before, I was at Amazon for a reason. I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I wanted to run a business. I wanted to lead big business. So I couldn't fail because I defined my path. Like I had a direct tie. I didn't know how to get there. I didn't know how I would lead to entrepreneurship, but I knew that if I wanted to succeed as an entrepreneur one day and I wanted to one day be an entrepreneur, I had to figure it out. So, and I think maybe the difference between people who crumble and just give up and people who push forward, they have a, they have a bigger reason as to why they're enduring the stress in the moment. And that's what propelled me to stay hungry and figure it out. Is this um, being hungry to become an entrepreneur? Do you have an inspiration or is, you know, what's the story behind that? You know what? It's, it's a great question. I don't know. You know, Gloria, I, I, I said it before. I've always been hungry. I've, I was, you know, in high school, the captain of my sports teams. I, I wasn't that book smart. I wasn't that book smart. I had to work my ass off to get good grades, but I've just had that drive. And Mm -hmm. I work with, on a given month, I work anywhere with 20 to 30 entrepreneurs right now, entrepreneurs and coaches. And the consistent thing I see, I have guys that have gone from zero. I have one guy's name's Nico DeBrain. He went from zero dollars. And after 12 weeks of working together, he went from zero dollars without even a program to $18,000. He just finished week 12 last week. Eight, 12 weeks earning 18,000. I have another guy, David Riggs. He went from $6,000 per month in his business to at the end of November, after 12 weeks, did 52,000. And then I, I could keep going on and on. The consistent thing I see with my entrepreneurs that the ones who succeed, they are so hungry. They just want it and they will work so hard. And it's when you're able to combine that insatiable drive with, I want to be great. I want to do great things. 
and you combine that with the right process, you, when you work smart, you have the right system, that's when amazing things happen. And I think, you know, if, if someone's not motivated, well, you need to find your motivation. You need to find your why. Like what is going to be that North Star that is going to make you want to strive for greatness? And if you don't have that, like we can't even, the conversation doesn't even matter. You have to figure that out before you even consider anything else. And I'll pause there. I think that's the really important thing. Okay. Okay. I, I super curious, dude, super curious. Um, and it's not about your, um, your, um, your business. So I, I, I didn't hear your backstory of your childhood. So I don't know where that came from, but I'm curious about, did you grow up in a single family household? Were your parents together? Yeah, I think so. I grew up in a, a really good household. My parents were together. They still are together. And, you know, talk about work ethic. So my, my mom has crazy work ethic. She's, she, I grew up with her not really being around that much, which that has led on a subconscious level to its own traumas in my life, right? With the, the main provider of my family, the, the person who I looked up to the most, who taught me how to act professionally, how to work hard, wasn't around because she was at work. Um, my work ethic probably comes from there to your point. My desire to be great probably comes from trying to appease my mother because my mother did great by working hard. So I probably wanted to appease her. And on a subconscious level, I probably still am. Um, but I got a lot of love though. And I told you guys before the call, I did, I grew up Jewish, right? I still am Jewish culturally. I'm not really religiously per se, like an observant Jew, but you know, talk about mindset. It really, the Jew, I really do believe Jews have an unfair advantage. Um, not because of resources that granted there are plenty of resources, I grew up in a community where I grew up around doctors, lawyers, I saw entrepreneurs. And then you look at like Hollywood, you look at something like Mark Zuckerberg, like there are just names like that got that gone for a while because they're Jewish and I see them, they're Jewish. Well, I'm Jewish. I can do it too. So you talk about mindset, planting seeds. I've had discussions around this. Why are different cultures around the world? Some are successful, some aren't. And I think a big part of that just has the are you able to see someone else doing great things? And what's that impact on the psychology of the child, of the boy and the girl when they look up? Wow. So thank you for sharing your story, buddy. Um, that's what I was trying to understand. So I was, I did more research on subconscious beliefs and where they come from. And it basically described it as like software. So you grew up in a great family household, but your mama's, worked her ass off for whatever reason, you know, she's not here to say what it was. You saw that. So innately that became part of you. It, it wasn't like your mom said, Hey, Jordan, um, let me, let me tell you how to work your ass off. It subconsciously want to be a, a belief. And I totally resonate with that higher self when it culturally came there. So I grew up in an all black neighborhood and, um, and most of my, my, you know, people I grew around with were, um, um, oh shit, I'm be honest. Uh, none were, but my dad. My dad was the only one that wanted to be different, do different things. He wanted to learn more. And he's always said, son, in life, I'm going to teach you how to be an adult, not a child. But he did say one thing I will never forget. Son, it's all about exposure. Like I have my cousins, their own welfare, their own section A. But shit, they always had a brand new Michael Jordan shoes every month. Like, where's my <laughs> shoes at? Where's my Air Max 90s? Where's my clothes at? I'm like, I'm my dad. I know my dad can afford it. He has a business. He has, a, he has cars. He also all this. But as a kid, I didn't see this. Mm-hmm. Even though they had the Michael Jordan shoes, the brand new shoes every month, their own section and welfare, they didn't own anything. While my dad gravitated towards, I'm going to own a home. I'm going to own my card. I'm going to have a bank account. I'm going to have credit cards. I'm good credit. <laughs> Those are things we're exposed to. But as a kid, you're like, man, I, I, I want to have these. So my, my innate work ethic it came from my father. My dad was a workaholic. He died working. And because he didn't take any vacations, he didn't take time off for himself. He didn't meditate. He didn't hire a coach. He didn't have all these things. And all that stress killed him internally over time. Yeah. And listen to your story, it resonated with me because – I, I you know what innately thinking about this, I want to please my dad. 
So I try to get good grades. I put try to put my effort in to pleasing him because that's what I really wanted to do. I mean, obviously he's not here to defend himself. Um, he grew really poor. So for him, his ideas, I gotta work my ass off because he grew up in a family, I think eight or ten, if I calculate them right. My grandfather, my dad's dad, was they called horse chaser. So that means that he would get paid on Friday. On uh, Friday night, Saturday morning, he's at the racetrack chasing the horses, right? Trying to, hey, if I got 200 bucks, I'm going to try to double it, right? And we'll lose. And they had no money. And they were always living place to place as squatters, not owning anything. So when we got a chance to leave Chicago, we grew up and go to California. It was a sense that I'm going to be something, I'm going to be something different. And he got all kinds of names like, um, uh, I'll just say it, uppity nigga. That was the term he got. He got a term whitewash. He got a term, you think you're better than me. And hearing what you're talking about, growing with doctors and lawyers, he got opposite. He got the derogatory stuff because now, well, you're not, you're not one of us because you want to do something different, you're not one of us. When you're in your childhood, listen to your story, it was like, well, you better be better than us. If I'm a doctor, you better be a, a better doctor than me or a better lawyer. So I know I went on a, a, a 10, um, uh, um, talked about my childhood dude it's all about you so i, I apologize no it's just, I love when it. you hear something <laughs> resonate in that man you're like man shit someone can, someone can understand you know it's all gonna stand the story behind that and it's awesome to hear that so yeah yeah and and gloria i, I know you're about to jump in i, I would love to hear your <laughs> that's <input>. okay <laughs> no please, no please i share. just <laughs> no i just wanted to say that these are the things that was instilled in us that we didn't realize until um, you know, as we get to a certain point in our life or if when once you've actually done some discovery, like what we did and have a different awareness. And, and these are also a lot of the things that, I, you know, I would like a lot of, you know, the children out there to kind of just pay attention because it, it, it is hard um, to pay attention to that because, you know, with the way the society is right now, it's, it's you know, it's, there's things like let's say in the social media that they tend to follow but again um growing up um we don't see those and we don't you know how our parents are we don't realize that they are they are somewhat inspiring us and what they're doing actually does mean something and look at us and we end up growing up yeah we it's you don't <laughs> see and you don't appreciate it until later on in life you know and it just sucks that I wish that even like us growing up, I wish we had this kind of awareness or or something even back then. Yeah. And I think that that's the cool thing about being alive right now because it's changing. In New Jersey, mm -hmm. um, there's mandated meditation times. Um, and I know that because I have a cousin who's a teacher who does meditations with elementary schoolers, teaches them how to breathe. Um, but to to make this last, I'll make this last point on, on your childhood. So if you're a listener and you haven't explored the impact of your childhood on your life and you really want to understand yourself, that's where you go. So there's a saying, you give me the boy, I'll show you the man. I think it's between 90 and 95% of your psychology, your subconscious behaviors and thought patterns is made up by the time you're seven. So because of that, the way you act between the ages of seven till 20, 30, 40, 50, it's already wired in you. Most of that comes from your parents. And then you talk about your traumas. We as children at some level have traumas. Traumas could be as small as you're being called dumb or your parents don't look at you the right way. And you make a, you make a definition of that to be as, and it could be as big as some of the obvious traumas we see. But there's something called imago therapy. It's really, it's a really great work for relationships. If you're in a relationship um, with a spouse, it's, gosh, it's such good work. But what they talk about is we try to heal ourselves with our spouses from the mm -hmm. traumas that we had as children. We're actually attracting from our spouses the people that are going to help heal us or trigger us it's both mm -hmm. sides of the coin but it all goes back to childhood to, to to our point right if you wanted to be great you can't go back explore your childhood so ron i really appreciate you kind of directing the conversation back to that point because i think it was a great a great um adjustment the combo and i love that you've mentioned meditation um i too have experienced that and the benefit of of the meditation 
And just, I was just, before um, we jumped on to this, I was just mentioning it to Ron, how I was able to really experience like deep meditation. And I felt like, I almost felt when I opened my eyes, I felt like, what the heck just happened to me? You know, but it was such a wonderful feeling. I felt like I was floating. I was in a different world. And it really opened up something else more to me where I, where I am, what I really want to do and, you know, the path that I really want to follow in my life where I'm at now. And it's really just trusting the process. And, you know, another thing about this, the meditation, when you said, um, I think it was, did you say you had a friend that does meditation with the, um, with the children at school? Mm-hmm. And so I've also tried that with some of my students. And I, I didn't think what it would be like. I don't know how they would feel because these are just, you know, they're teenagers. So they have a different mindset still. And when we did this a few times, most of them ended up liking it to where they wanted, they were asking me to do it once a week. It's, it's amazing. It, it it really is like I could not, you know, I couldn't believe how how it was when I just it was just all let me just try this with you guys. Let's see if this works. I did ten minutes, fifteen minutes, and they were really just there, and it opened up something different for them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that. It's a it go. We're at a, at a great time in our society where you know. <clears throat> 20 years ago, and we're all in our 30s, or almost 40s, uh, talking to a therapist or a psychologist or a coach was, was taboo. So if you want to talk, first of all, coach, I, I don't think that wasn't even heard of. I mean, coach, you talk about basketball coach, football coach. I mean, I'm just, maybe there was, I just wasn't exposed to it. So I, I only have one perspective. But more or less growing up was all about, okay, you're going through a problem, you know what, turn to religion. You're gay, turn to religion. You have some self-doubt, turn to religion. You have um, insecurities, turn to religion. You're broke, turn to religion. You can't pay your bills, turn to religion. And yeah, but religion isn't that. So I become more spiritual now than religion, organized religion especially. But talking to a therapist and life coach and, and all these things, but you have to have some serious problems. I mean, you have to be borderline suicidal. That that's that's kind of where the view was. So yeah, it's we're at a, a great time now where there's a lot of coaches out there, therapists, and it's okay. If you're 15 years old, if you're 10 years old, or if you're 100 years old, you need some help. They're out there, and with social media, you can expose yourself to those uh, different people. You don't have to find okay. Well, my insurance only covers this person. I go to them, but we don't like them. They're not what I'm looking for. Now you're exposed to different views or different ways. You can go out on a bunch of different interviews and talk to people and figure out what coach or what therapist or what psychologist resonates with you. It's not what my insurance has or my parents say. And people are open. That's the main thing right now we have to look at is that people are open to a different way of living. And the first way that's different living is the mind. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And when you talked about your experiences in life and living at Am- not living working at Amazon, it was the mind. The once your mindset changed, everything around tended to change. Just like Tony Robinson talks about, your why be- became became your why and commitment of whatever that is became the way you start to change your life. And that's awesome, man. It's amazing the, the time we're living right now of getting help and Gloria's pursuing her meditation. And I'm pursuing my, my other uh, different ways in my life because if I become better overall, I can then help more people. Exactly. Yeah. And I want to add, I want to have two points. I'm going to kind of transition the conversation from here. But to add to that, um, I love to say if you don't have a coach, therapist, or psychoanalyst, y- you are really missing out. I have a therapist, I have a coach a life coach. I work with a healer. I work with so many different people because like transparently, I grew up having a privileged childhood and yet I still have so many obstacles to, to, to overcome. And if I'm saying this as someone who really, I came from a loving home, I didn't have to worry about my next meal growing up. And I still realize the challenges that just the human mind creates you know, everyone should have that because we all have, you guys know, if our gremlins, right? Mod two, we, we all went through that. 
And I really believe everyone should have a coach or a therapist or a psychoanalyst because you need to build awareness if you want to live a good and happy life. That's the only thing we care about. But then here's the second thing, and I've alluded to it with work. If, if there is something you want in life, it's not about working hard for it. And what they say in NLP, I allude to NLP before, there is a system or strategy and a process to streamline your way to get it. That's what I teach, right? What do you want to accomplish? I've worked primarily with entrepreneurs and coaches. What is it that you want to accomplish? And what is the strategy or the process that we could just model our behavior after? So we don't have to work hard. We're probably going to work hard because we want to do good things. But we streamline our time and our path to that goal and desired outcome. NLP is the study of success and the science of success. If you want to accomplish something, just look for a model or behavior from someone who has already done it and streamline your path there. That's why coaches exist. And I love that you again mentioned that even coming from a a very good um, household, you know, there you still there's still something, right? You still have to go, you still go through some situation. Nobody's perfect. But you know, there's that view of, you know, you have a perfect family, you, you come from a really nice, you're being raised in a good household, you're perfect, right? So there's that view or even being an only child, you're the only child, you have everything, you don't have to share anything with anybody, you're perfect. And I love that you mentioned that because we're, we're not perfect. No one is. The human Nobody's is a perfect. broken, the human's a broken system, right? The way our brains and our psyche was made, it's it's in turn for 2020 and then 2021, the way our mind is just naturally made up, it doesn't naturally create the outcomes we want. Those outcomes are, we just want to be freaking happy. Mm -hmm. The way the mind is built, the mind is built to survive. It's not built to thrive by nature. That's why you need to study and learn these different approaches. Mindfulness, like happiness studies. I know IPEC's huge on sharing the, the happiness studies, right? So mm -hmm. because we have a broken mind, a broken system, doesn't matter what walk of life you're from. Don't look at other people's Instagrams and their social media because they only post the good shit. So few people actually share the actual shit that they go through. Just <laughs> and a lot of the times it's not true. <laughs> Oh my, oh my, I'll just give the quick example on LinkedIn. I, it's so funny because I talk to so many entrepreneurs on LinkedIn and then I see them posting content about their, like about their businesses and whatnot. And then I have a private conversation with them where I'm, I'm guiding them and just giving them value. And it's like, holy crap, this person has no clue what they're talking about, but because they're trying to build a brand, the perception mm -hmm. that they put out there is like, they have all the answers, which I mean, that's how it works. That's how even this works. Right. Um, but yeah, you just got to lean into you. Look in the mirror. Don't look outside. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you talk about um, happiness, right? You just got to find that happiness. How do you find happiness and what, what makes you happy? Love this question. So one thing I share with the people I work with is I think the way Western civilization and how we in the United States think about happiness is we think of happiness almost as if it's like a high, like a state of ecstasy. Um, when you think of happiness, you might think of a peak experience. That's not happiness. That's like pure joy. That's like having a, a shit ton of fun, right? You, you're at a birthday with a, with a child. You're, you're going out to an amazing dinner with your spouse. You go to a sporting event. You watch an amazing movie. Like whatever it is, those are acute and peak life experiences. That is happiness. It's just, you know, jacked up with dopamine. What mm -hmm. I like to say is the real expectation that we should be setting as a culture is and what I share with people is the desired outcome is I want you to think about a monk sitting and meditating and having a soft smile. That's a state of peace and joy, right? Level six, as we know from IPEC. That's where we want to actually shoot for, where you're even keeled and just in this everlasting state of peace. So Gloria, what's my definition and how do I get there? I define happiness as being appreciative and grateful for being in the moment being appreciative for what I have today, no matter if that's a peak experience or an average experience. Because as Tony Robbins say, 
the majority of life is mundane, monotonous, and routine. And if you can't find the beauty in those mundane, monotonous, and, ru- and routine experiences, you're missing out on life. That's where gratitude comes in. It's just really about being at peace and grateful. I have two legs and two arms. I have the capacity yeah. to have a conversation. I have my health today. The sun is out. Wow. So happy about that. And just being that monk-like soft smile, this is totally chill. And I'm totally at peace with where I'm at right now. That is what I think happiness should be defined as, in my in my opinion. Well, amen to that. Have you found <laughs> happiness yourself? As we speak right now. Yeah, every day. And this is, you know, the first thing you said, how are you doing today? And I said to you, Ron, I'm always good. Um, And when I was, when I, with my clients, when I was a manager at Amazon, people would say, is like, you're always happy. And And when I was a leader or when I'm with my clients, well, I look at myself as a performer. I had to put on my, as I was trained, my Mickey Mouse face for people. So, you know, if you, you fake it till you make it is actually a really thing, really real thing. Cause if you actually put your state into a state of happiness, you'll be happy. But yeah, am I happy? I freaking love my life. Um, do I have opportunities and like, do I fight with my wife sometime? Do I have moments where I feel sad? Like, so even like in the year of 2020 have moments of like what feels like depression? I do, but that's part of being a human, right? It's, and what we talk about in IPEC, right? When you're in level one, right, the difference between the greats and and I say greats, the people who accomplish and do a lot of things for society and just live a happy life and the people who are depressed, it's the amount of time you spend in a state of depression. So if you can reduce your reactionary time in that state, you'll be happier for a longer period of time. And I think that's where the mindset training really comes in, building awareness when you feel depressed, building awareness when I feel sad, when I feel emotionally triggered. Okay, now that I know I feel this, what can I do to get out of it? And I have a process. I call it um, breaking fragmentation. I do breath work. I align myself to a, a visual exercise and I give myself love and I actually could come back to like, okay, I'm back at peace again. Yeah, that's that's good. And that's the great thing about, the greatest thing about having that awareness and having that mindset because you're able to coach yourself. Um, yeah. And, you know, and again, um, so I've also, um, I also do breath work and I do meditation and all of these is not just to fix yourself and to heal yourself. I think for me, it's an ongoing process. It always is. I think healing yourself because old trauma and old wounds can obviously fester and it could be a simple trigger. And when they come up, you got to recognize them and try to transition out of that. So they don't, they don't fuss faster to more. So if you have one negative thought, then it goes to two, three, four. So if you ever notice, when you really have thoughts and you're aware of them, it's not just one negative thought. It multiplies routinely. So using breathwork meditation allows you to recognize that thought and at the same time come back to a state of bliss. Oh, yeah. And that's the main thing. Mm-hmm. So, Jordan, as we talked about your backstory, where you are now, what is it you specifically do and who do you help at this moment? Yeah. And thank you for that question, that transition. Um, so I run a company, it's called the Founders Factory. And we help entrepreneurs and coaches systematize their success so they can grow a six, multi-six and seven figure business. And all I got to do is pray for six figures and I get it or seven figures and get it <laughs> well, well Ron if you if if you click this ad today yes yes you can't no um so depending on the business I Ron you and I sh- spoke a couple weeks ago and I actually showed you the model in which I go about this um everything from a business perspective whether you're an entre- and I I primarily help service entrepreneurs so if you have a physical product um I'm probably not going to be the best guy for you but if you sell a service I work with videographers, video, guys who sell video editing. I work with a guy who's selling VR experiences as a service. I, I could go on. I have about 20 of those types of entrepreneurs and I have coaches. Um, it's it's a few things. One, who's what's the model and system? And who is the ideal client? So if you have a target market, you need to niche down as much as possible. I'm going to give you a quick example. I spoke to a coach this week on Monday who is a fatigue coach for nurses. 
that's as niche as you can get. And that's perfect. So once you have that really specific niche and you know who they are, well, where are they? So fatigue nurses, I could probably find like 10, 20,000 nurses in Facebook groups. And I could definitely find them on LinkedIn because you could search by jobs and I could totally find them on Instagram. They're all over the place. If that's the case, now you need to one, build a brand and then share your, your stories, your insights, give value just on these platforms and two, connect with them at scale. So a lot of businesses talk about make posting ads and making ads. I don't believe in ad. I believe in organic reach. So if you connect with these people in their Facebook groups, if you connect with them on LinkedIn or Instagram or even Twitter and are able to get people into conversation where you could build rapport, you can hear their story, learn what's what they want to accomplish and why they don't have it. And if you could generally just give them value and share what you have going on with you, like don't sell, serve and just share. If you can do that at scale, and then on the back end, track the data. So if I reach out to a thousand nurses and I could get a hundred of these nurses into conversations, and if I have a hundred conversations, I'm able to close 20 deals. Well, I know for every a thousand people I reach out to, 2%, 20 people is going to turn into a new client. And that's how you systematically start to build a practice or a business. And I teach entrepreneurs and coaches how to do that at scale and how to eventually build teams to do that where they can remove themselves from the equation. Awesome. And how, how long have you been building this, uh, this uh, business for yourself? Do you work, is it your business or do you work with somebody or, okay, so it's your business, the hundred percent going to work with you. Now, how long did it take for you to, or how long, well, two questions, how long have you been in business? And second question, how long did it take for you to find this method? Great question. So I've been working with entrepreneurs since the summer of 2019. I've been coaching since summer of 2018. Um, how long it took me about a full year, a little bit more than a full year to figure out the the correct system. So after IPEC, I went on to invest another $25,000 into coaches, experts, the SEO, the website, the marketers, the programs, you name it, Gloria and Ron, I invested in it. And my wife was not happy. Um, but I just knew, <laughs> I just knew like th- there, someone's already figured this out. Why am I going to spend multiple years trying to figure it out? I have this capital, this cash from Amazon stock. I'm just going to skip time and invest in it. Um, so it took me about a year. And I think the really shitty thing about our industry, Tony Robbins calls coaching a bastard industry for a reason. There are a lot of people who like the person who built my website, she was an claimed to be an SEO and website and branding expert. I never signed. I never got, I paid like $4,000 for her services. I didn't get a dollar back and there was no return on investment. Um, so after that year, I found out the, the systems of marketing and the system of sales and really service that really took to build a brand and do it from a service perspective. And with my entrepreneurs, it's been amazing, right? We have, have like five guys who I started working with this calendar year who are going to hit seven figures in 2021. That's really cool to see. That's amazing. I mean, it it, it seems like you invest in, in these coaches that you were hiring experts, but at the same time, you also figure out how to create a formula for yourself, right? I mean, because you can't keep investing in 25, then you'd be another expert. He must now 50. Now, not investing in 50, find another expert's been doing, you invest in 100, right? Eventually, you have to have some, uh, you know, the pot will run dry, or you got to have a way to, um, I guess you would say, um, get your recoup your investment, right? But you did in creating these great formulas that people that you're coaching right now are making a crap ton of money off a simple system investing in you because you're the investment right and you're the roi and you're not just uh, and, and not just telling them what to do you're actually coaching them through you talked about earlier you had one guy that he posts this great brand recognition on his uh, linkedin page or facebook and you said wait a minute is that really you we're, we're talk dude it's not really you so what, what are you doing so with that being said is you know you got people that are gonna listen to our podcast that are in the service business that need some guidance, um, you know, and, and obviously you can see the ads, go oh, pay for Facebook ads, pay for that app, pay for this, uh, spend $10,000 on a website, build your app. And do you think doing all that is a better investment or investing in you is a better investment? Uh, there's a million ways to a million. I think it's completely egotistical to say that investing in me is the right investment. 
because not everyone is right for me. Like I have to sign off on you if I'm going to work with you too. Um, I'll say the difference between myself and some of these other guys, right? You can build a million dollar business with ads and with organic at reach. It doesn't matter. You need to figure out what's, how do you want to work with? And you need to really like those people too. Like I love my clients. I don't work with anyone who I don't freaking love working with because it makes my life happy. The thing that's different compared, I told you about the woman who with SEO, I just guarantee everything. Ron, Gloria, like, let's say we're on a call and I'm like, Hey, like, this is what I got going on. This is my program. What I will do is I'm going to guarantee your satisfaction. If you don't feel like you receive the value, I'll either work for you for free until you do, or I'll give your money back. And what I like to say, there's no risk with that. It's like, it's either going to work or you're going to get your ROI. You're going to get your results that you want, or Hey, it's free. So where's the risk? And I think honestly, that's as we transition into the next decade, how business is going to be done from a service side more consistently. Yes, I 100% and no, uh, let's talk about Amazon. The reason why they're big is not because they can do exactly. 2 million units a minute. They're big because they figured out what they cannot live without and what people want. So if you call Amazon today, you're not happy. They give you money back and give you a new product. So the service there is 110% because they can't live without customers. So how do people contact you? Do you, I mean, you're, you have a great business, you helped a lot of people, and you said something that most people don't understand. It's a two-way street. When I was out there uh, personal training, I mean, even coaching, I said, look, you know, this is a team effort. And obviously, we have an, a call or a Zoom or meeting face-to-face. We have to have the ability to work together because I, I can't do all the work. You you have to show up to training sessions. You have to do the work coaching. You have to do the work that we did with coaching. So the, the fact that you work with your people and give them guarantee, that's the thing that most people don't do. Most people like the website person was like, okay, get paid $4,000. I'll do SEOs, but they didn't work. Well, you know, it takes time. They, they'll give you some kind of excuse, but you have a guarantee. So how do people find you? Like, how do they contact you? Yeah. So if anyone listens to this and wants to connect with me, my website is thefoundersfactory.com. You could also go to jordanrosscoaching.com. My Calendly and all the information is on those websites. I'm also on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram at, of jo- at Jordan Ross. Um, and it's usually Jordan Ross Coaching on Instagram or um, on LinkedIn, Jordan Ross. Dude, amazing. So a lot, right. a lot of people are reaching out to you pretty soon. So as we always, as I get towards the, the end of our podcast and ask them contact information, I always like to hear a personal, well, sorry, no, I, we as in Glory, I like to hear what is one takeaway that they can say in a few sentences or a paragraph, let's say that about living or about their business that you want to tell our audiences? If there's one takeaway, business or life, find a, find your desired outcome, find the person system or model that's already doing it and go take that model and put it on your life. Period. I love it. Very simple. Straight to the point. So Jordan, it has been a pleasure being a guest. You bring in the new year positivity. I feel it coming through the the, the, the microphone and I, I love your story. And that's the reason why we start Life to Shuffle is your story. Uh, so as I'm going to tell my audiences out there that you know how to find Jordan Ross. He's an amazing person. He's all about service and giving back to community. And for ourselves, if you're interested in podcasts and you're interested in being a guest and telling your story or telling your business, you can join our Facebook group, Life's a Shuffle on Facebook, or you can send an email to Life's a Shuffle at gmail.com. Send us your information. You'll be a featured guest or comment. Your free comment will also be featured on our extra podcast as well, too. This is Ronald Johnson, your uh, mindful coach. And thank you for listening to another episode of Life's a Shuffle. And also to add to that, um, with the um, the Facebook group and also the email is also a way of connecting with us and not just with us, but also with our guests. If it's something um, that they resonate with, with our guests, it's also another way to connecting with them. And Jordan, um, I would like to thank you for joining us today. And like what Ron was saying is I commend you for um, your your work ethic. You're, you're, you're driven and committed and, um, and you believe in what you do. And I could, I could hear it in your voice and the passion. Um, again, um, good luck. And I, I wish you the best of luck this coming year as well. 
Thank and you again, too. Like, yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. My gratitude and energy out for you guys, like sending just really great vibes to you and the people you're going to impact in 2021. And I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank Likewise, you. man. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, guys.